Good morning. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Be Sober podcast by me, Lisa. And me, Alex. Alex with a really croquet voice. Lisa might say it was sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to spell your name like Alex with an, an A or something. <laughs> no, I've proper lost my voice. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> It will be a shame. I'm doing a workplace talk for us this afternoon. That one commenter on YouTube that time will be absolutely buzzing. <laughs> yeah, what a wanker. Let's start as we mean to go on. <laughs> what did they say? Talks about herself too much. Oh, yeah. well, sorry. It's only my podcast. You know again. what? Um, so I feel like we've not sport for ages and ages and ages. Why is this? It's because you were on holiday and I was in London. So two weeks on the run, we actually haven't spoken in ages. Oh, and ages. it's been forever. I've missed you. I've missed you. I actually yeah. have missed you. I've been dying to talk to you. We've been filling our what's um, our podcast chat up. I'm going to sorry, Lisa. Notes. I'm going to mute for a second while I finish putting my earrings in because I'm always. Late. Oh, that's really handy on an audible podcast. Uh, like, hey, hold on, I'll just balance it in? for anyone who's watching. I'll just balance it here while I. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I thought you thought they were going to make like a noise. No, did I tell you at the time I had to go to the infirmary because of earrings? Yeah, last think, time. That's I think what that was what we were talking about because you were convinced that the back was hidden in your ear. It, I've still got a lump in my ear. You from still that. think it's in your ear? No. Well, I, I don't know. I've never found that earring, and there's still a lump in my ear. So I don't know. So maybe. I don't know. And Rob still swears he didn't take it out when I was in bed. So we will oh, see. A bit suspicious. Go on, tell me what you were going to tell me. Anyway, I'm here, I'm here now. Um, well, I was just looking at our podcast chat. Oh, <laughs> so, so we have a WhatsApp and we just put our little notes in. I think we spoke about this last time. And yeah, we did. It's like full details in it. Anyway, she's, cha- she's changed it. She's up to game this week. So the first thing on Friday, the 12th of July, she puts in dogs willy. <laughs> <laughs> like nothing else, dogs willy. Can I confess some of you forgot. Just put that in to shock you, just because I wanted to show you that I can do stuff in two words. Shut up. That's the yeah, no, I'm, I'm not. The, no, that's not the truth. <laughs> there is a story I have to tell you. <laughs> Thank God for that, because that's gross. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is a story. Go on, carry on. <laughs> Oh, do you want to hear the story first? Well, you- <laughs> well, yeah, that's the idea of the podcast chat. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to tell you about it. Next. <laughs> You've just written ooh. Get after you said dogs willy. That weren't a no. That were me saying ooh. <laughs> right, well, let me tell you. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me tell you what happened. It is quite a funny story, actually. So a couple of Thursdays ago, I was ready to go out to to lead the choir like I do at the church. And my puppy, who's not quite five months old, decided to have like a bit of playtime with his dog bed. Right? So he, was, he was humping his bed, but it got a little bit too vigorous, right? And as he must have done something, and he's, I've never seen, I've had male dogs before, but at least I've never seen anything like what happened to my dog. The whole thing, and like extra came out of its pouch. Oh, you know what? George's keeps coming out. because it was massive. <laughs> well, yours is a big dog. <laughs> yeah, but even for a big dog, there was a lot of willy. Oh, it's so gross. And it, it oh, looked like... But the thing was, it got out right. That's not even the funny bit. And then the dog was in like an arched position and couldn't get it back in. Couldn't get what back in? It's willy. Well, how do you know we were trying to get it back in? Because he was walking around in pain with his back all humped up. (laughs) It was awful. Anyway, so I decided, like, Sam's going, you've got to call the vet, you've got to call the vet. And I'm like, there's nowhere going to be, it's like seven o'clock, like, I'm not going to call the emergency vet. I said, I'm on my way out, you're going to have to deal with this. And he's like, no, 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 you've got it. I said, you've got one, you surely know what to do with it. (laughs) 
said, yeah, I've never been like this with mine. Anyway, so I um, eventually just had this brainwave that Jenny, who's the children's minister at the church, yeah. was a vet. Oh, it's making me feel sick, this conversation. <laughs> He's such a prude. <laughs> So I phoned Jenny up, but Sam didn't know she used to be a vet. So he just thought I'd phone Jenny to like tell her about the situation mid crisis. Yeah. Which I hadn't. I phoned her up and I was like, Jenny, um, I'm really sorry to bother you, but my dog's really stuck out. And honestly, and this is what I said, and it looks like its testicles are out as well. Now, can I just say they weren't, but that's how much of it looked like it was out. It was was too much. So she was like giggling in the background and obviously... She's got a whole family there, so she didn't. Re- she was not prepared for me to intrude in their evening with a whole dog willy conversation. So she said, "Have you got any KY jelly?" I was like, "No." Funnily enough, Jenny, I don't stop KY jelly. She went, "What about any lube?" I'm like, yeah, no. I just said, "Would lube be all right?" <laughs> Could you not be like? But then I don't think you want to talk to the minister about like I'll run upstairs and get the lube. <laughs> I, honestly, even if I wanted to talk about it, I don't have any. But what I couldn't get my head around was why didn't she just say, have you got any Vaseline or have you got any coconut oil? Because they're things that most people have knocking around. Anyway, so she suggested that I had to help the dog manoeuvre it back inside its pouch. Oh, this is disgusting. Anyway, while I'm on it's the phone... It's giving me anxiety. I don't know if it's a coffee or this conversation. While I was on the phone, the dog did something. There was a bit of a yelp and it started to go back in on its own so there was a bit of a sigh of relief that I did not have to manoeuvre the willy in but then when it went back in because it had been so far out it pulled all its skin inside so he turned his own pouch inside out I can't bear it I had to get the dog's skin and oh no no I did I, I, I've got to say, I don't think I'd have done any of this. Well, I did. I did. I did. And anyway, it, all, all the hair that had gone back inside then came out and everything was all right. But the funny thing was that I then proceeded to go down to the church and you know I can't keep anything in. So oh. literally I told my 75-year-old choir that I'd been manoeuvring the dog's willy out of its pouch. Oh, that is disgusting. That, that's, I can't I can't bear anymore like I actually we had so much to talk about and I know Holly's who, uh, who we've got on as a guest today is really excited is she in the room not yet I'll tell you when she's in the room don't worry oh, oh, she's right. just appeared in the room now so I'm just going to send her a message that we'll be there in a few minutes while we carry on this conversation because there is quite a lot to say I know, but I don't think we're going to be able to get it all in, to be honest. So I reckon we'll just, we can get a little bit more. We'll, we might have to do a little bonus episode. Well, or we could just stay on at the end. Should we stay on at the end today and finish our conversation so people get a bit extra of us talking crap? Yeah, we could do. Let's now, do we don't that. know whether we're going to do this or not. This could be a surprise. It could not. Yeah, so <laughs> let's do just that. filter through anyway. Let's, if we uh, feel like chatting, if we've got anything else to say that we don't manage to start, talk about with Holly... We will stay on at the end and finish the episode because just while we are here, this is probably the last in this season before we take a little break and then we'll be back. Anyway, do you want to talk about Holly a little bit? Or do you just want no, to do it? No, well, no, we might as well let her in. Um, she's dead excited to come on today, so I can't wait to see her. She's just sent me a picture. She's got a sign on her front door saying, do not disturb or something. Let me have a look. What's it say? She coming in. Oh, she's yeah, she's on her way in. Don't worry. Do not knock. Sorry, recording a podcast. I used to. I used to do that on mine. Do you remember? And now I we'll just answer my door. <laughs> yeah, you just bugger off now mid conversation, don't you? Hi, Holly. Hello. How, you How are you? Hi, <laughs> lovely. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, lovely to meet you too, Alex. Um, when I listen to your podcasts, I'm always like, yeah, I can't tell which is Lisa now. <laughs> really? I, I find that dead hard to believe that people can't tell us apart, but I guess that, uh, yeah, you don't really, I don't know. Oh, I mean, literally, you, you sound like you could be identical twin sisters. <laughs> not funny. Cause I, I think love that different. because Alex thinks she's got a posher accent now. So thank you, Holly. I have, I have got a posher accent. I won't be having any of this nonsense. Um, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I lost my voice actually today, so you might get a little bit of a break from me talking too much. Doubt it, but I'll do my best. <laughs> you know, you can't tell someone you've lost your voice with a voice. Like, it's you know not I mean? lost. 
there. All right, I'm losing. I'll put it into the correct context. It's gone a bit croaky. Um, Too much talking, Ree, poorly. I have been poorly, right? Well, this brings me to one of our stories. I'm going to tell it now because you've asked. (laughs) I I went down to London this last week. I'm not going to tell all the London stuff, but on the train on the way down, right? So my little boy had been poorly. He'd had suspected scarlet fever that turned out to be slap cheek. And on the way down there... I had a bit of a sore throat and then all of a sudden, I am not joking, I'm going to do this on screen for people who are watching and I did record a video so if anyone's questioning my exaggeration here, I promise I'm not. I'll show Lisa the video to prove it. I um, was sat on the train and all of a sudden my lips started to go like this. <laughs> but not with my finger in place, right? So for anyone who can't see, it was like when you get an eye twitch, my lip was twitching on the left side of my mouth, my top lip. Like Elvis. Like Elvis. But yeah, it's never happened before, right? Never. Well, happened it has happened before. Well, it might have done, but it never happened to me before. No, it's happened to you before when we did the cold water dip. No, that, is, that was like a stroke. Did. That was different. <laughs> that was different, right? The cold water thing, I got a numb face and my mouth fell and I looked like I'd had a stroke. With this one, it was tingling and twitching and I felt like I was having a stroke. How I imagine that feels. So I thought I was having a stroke, right? Obviously, I wasn't having a stroke. It was absolutely fine. And the GP basically told me to stop worrying. It was just a twitchy lip and I needed to get over myself. (laughs) That's what it was. But since then, I think what it was genuinely is all my sinuses had been compressed against the nerve. And that's what he thought. So in answer to your question in a really long-winded, boring way, I've not been well. (laughs) Oh, sorry. It's like one of them moments, Holly, where you really wish you hadn't have asked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think she asked. I think she was just saying, hiya, how are you? <laughs> I know, and all I did was went, guess what? I've got no voice. I'm not well. Here's my London story. <laughs> Oh. Anyway, Holly, I've um, I have met you before, haven't I? Um, yeah. At a walk that one of our ambassadors, Barbara, organised ages yeah. ago. But you've yeah. been up to so much stuff since then. So, firstly, do you want to do um, a little bit of an introduction and tell us what you've yeah. been up to? Um, yeah, sure thing. So, I mean, I stopped drinking. Well, I started my sober journey at the 1st of January 2023. And um, at the time, I was trapped in the cycle of binge drinking every weekend, feeling like absolute crap all week. But then as soon as it got to Thursday, oh, time for Prosecco, you know. And it was just yeah. this constant cycle. I was working part time in recruitment. I'd been in recruitment for 14 years and I'd gone to kind of self-employed and part-time to work with childcare. And I think having that freedom and independence and no accountability of going in the office and anybody saying to me, like, it made it a lot easier to get away with drinking as well in the week. Um, So, yeah, I was just really stuck in a rut January 2023, really stuck in a rut. Um, But fast forward to now, I'm now a alcohol-free coach. Yeah. I'm running wellness and sobriety retreats. Um, I'm booked in to start yoga teacher training in January next year. And I'm also kind of launching a platform called Soda Dates for people that want to go on a a date or connect with people, but without alcohol involved. So, and I've left my recruitment day job. I quit two weeks ago. Amazing. So all that since the 1st of January, 2023. (laughs) And for future listeners, today is the 24th of July 2024. That's like a lot of stuff in it within your first couple of years. Yeah, absolutely massive. Um, but you know, before I um I was gonna say before I started drinking, I started drinking when I was 12, so it's probably not really the best example. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, before I was 12, uh, I was quite a motivated, uh, hardworking <laughs> person. Before I was 12. <laughs> and I've got that back. I've got my best back. I like 
had to learn and um, yeah, it's all come back after 30 odd years of um, caning the booze. So. That's <laughs> like glimmers of it though, aren't they? You know, like throughout your life, because I always say that or oh, before I was a drinker, but that would have made me like 13, 12, 13. But the yeah. truth is that throughout your drinking, you have periods where it's probably not heightened as much as others. So in those times, you see that little version of the real you peeping mm-hmm. through, don't you? And then mm-hmm. you get consumed in what you're doing again. Um, yeah. But yeah, like you say, you know, you'll have known that you were always motivated and driven and wanting to learn, but you don't make time for those things when you're drinking, not because you're pissed all the time, but just because yeah, it's you not don't high know. priority to spend time on you. You just, you go out, you get drunk, you're having a laugh. Yeah, I genuinely don't think I knew who I was before I stopped drinking. Honestly, I, don't, I still I don't. Really... I know you better than you know you now. I reckon I <laughs> had a full meltdown yesterday. <laughs> what did I do ten years ago, Alex? Hold on a minute. I'll just get the date. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I think um, what I really want to talk to you about actually is this sober dating app because. <laughs> Um, I just think it's such an interesting subject. So firstly, why a sober dating app? Well, since I went sober and joined a few communities, especially I've got a lot of friends from the dry app and my best friends on there are all single. And they're literally like, we're doomed to be single forever because they don't want to go on a date. Because the chances are the date is going to rock up expecting them to drink or having had a drink themselves. Yeah. So if you go on a date for the first time and you're in your mid-40s, I mean, the chances of them not expecting you to drink alcohol is probably pretty slim to none. Yeah. Um, and my uh, my best friends as well up here in, in Leeds, um, they mostly don't drink just because they're a lot more mature than me and they realised it <laughs> quite a long time ago. <laughs> I'm always the last to catch up, but um, but you know they're all saying I can't go on a date because I don't want people to think I'm boring and I don't want to drink. Um, like my best friend was going to go on a date with a guy she'd been chatting with on one of the you know typical chat platforms, and she said, "Well, I can't go on a date because it's a Sunday." And I went, "And?" And she said, "Well, I'll be expected to drink, and I've got work the next day." And I was like. Someone has got to change the rhetoric on this. It just can't carry on like this. And then another girl I know who's um, uh, one of the sober butterflies went on a date and the guy turned up really drunk. And and she was like, how do I get out of this situation? She actually didn't feel that safe. Um, And like safety is another aspect that um, I've started to think about while I've been developing this as well, because like, you know, I always say, like, your mum always said, don't take sweets from, sweets from a stranger, right? So why would you go and get pissed with a stranger? Can we, we talk, talk about, about this? You know, there's so many risky strangers. situations that we've been in over the years. Yeah, yeah not, that's not what I want to talk about, Alex. Yeah, yeah. Have, you, have you ever, like, been on a date? I want, let's talk about piss dating. <laughs> I just it thought it was so interesting for me. It was always piss dating. I mean, because I've been married now for like eight years. So uh, yeah. But you're, so you're married. That's really interesting. So you're married, and then you've developed this app. Yeah. Oh, I've got so much. I want to talk about friends. friends. Yeah, I, really really my friends I love that. What a good friend are you? Get <laughs> a pen and paper, will you, Lisa, and start writing down your points. Bloody hell, they're all coming out in one go. No, I'm too excited. <laughs> got, right, she's like, got anxiety because of me talking about my dogs, Willie. You'll hear it when you listen to it. Oh, it's disgusting. In fact, I hope people have fast forwarded to this. <laughs> <laughs> Before well, we talk, talk about, about drunk dating, dating Lisa. In, gen- in general then, because like I do think it is a really difficult thing to do and lots of people have a drink for that little bit of Dutch courage. Yeah. But like if you are like, I'm going to say us because we was all kind of binge drinkers, they can end up in, you can end up in really dangerous situations, mm. can't you? Like I remember going on a date, um, me and Alex had gone into Manchester, do you remember? Oh God, don't. We, we'd gone out anxiety on a night. now. Oh. We'd gone out on a night out, and then I ended up agreeing to this date with this guy 
and then went on a date with this guy a few weeks later. I don't even remember much of the date. I did end up dating somebody else that I met on the train on the way to that date, actually. Yeah. But this is all because of Dutch courage. Do you know what I mean? Like now, if I go to Manchester on a train, I don't speak to anybody. How did I manage to end up dating somebody? <laughs> It's um, crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know, um, though, the other side, the flip side of that is, and this is what I was just going to add to it, is when Lisa did get sober and she did try dating again, the profile that she put out, and it relates to what you were just saying about people, you know, being a bit scared that they're going to get pressured. The profile Lisa put out there, there was no way anyone had dated her, let alone herself. Oh, it was so... Yeah, what, did you say, I'm sober and I like walks? Yeah. I'm not going to go on a date with you. Honestly, she was like, I don't want this person. I don't want that person. I don't want that person. I said, it's like bloody practical magic. I don't know if you've seen it with Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock in it. And she makes up because she gets her heart broken. She makes up this wish of a man with a star as his favourite shape and one blue eye and one green. And it's like, he's never going to exist, this man. And honestly, that will lease her. <laughs> well, the thing is, you do get more picky and you do raise your standards across all areas of your life when you quit drinking, don't you? So, yeah. you know, I can't blame I th you. I think you're dating the people you choose to date changes mm. like so when I did stop drinking I remember going on kind of some of the dating apps and looking at the type of guys I would have dated before and then having to really change it and I think it's really hard to change your profile on standard dating apps to say things like you don't drink because I you don't get the same attention, basically. You don't, which can then lead to you feeling quite shit about yourself. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So, well, like, I went the attention from all those people who are drinking either. So, no, it isn't but, but you've 22. got to learn that, I think, haven't you? Yeah. Because especially if it if it's in the early days, because you do want that attention, and then you've got to kind of learn to respect yourself enough to know that you don't want that attention, and to kind of hang fire do you know what I mean it's really hard I went on a date early on and I'd put on that I 100% didn't want to meet somebody that drank um and I had I changed my wording a little bit if I remember rightly you had to say bloody hell <laughs> <laughs> you so did something change it. like um I didn't want to I can't remember what it was. It was but something like I don't want a tea time drink I want it no it was something like I didn't want people who only drank to have a good time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But then what I found were the only people that wanted to get, like got in contact were like try off triathlon people and that yeah. oh yeah you had like dead like triathlon boring yeah, well I people. don't have a lot in common with people that do triathlon yeah and you know we all know that when you do stop drinking like not the fact that you don't drink isn't your identity you've got so much more about your life but in yeah. something than a dating app where all you've got is the first kind of um like appearance then you just I don't think you should have to label yourself yeah, and this is just a space. There are so many people that are sober curious. They don't want to say I'm sober curious, and a lot of people are, are anyway, but don't actually call it that. And yeah, well, they're not even. Oh, they don't even know they are. Yeah, absolutely. You, does your husband drink, Holly? No, he stopped. Um, he did the one year no beer in 2019, and then I, I was a bit like, oh, come on, you boring bastard, have a glass of wine with dinner. You know, I was the pusher. But you know, I caught up eventually. Oh, well done. So, that's a bit that's nice to kind of see that the other way around, actually, because we yeah. always see it the other way. That's yeah. really interesting. So yeah. you see, my husband doesn't drink and Lisa's partner doesn't drink. So not none of them drink. So I, I guess we've either fallen extremely lucky or we've certainly from my perspective just a real big control freak. <laughs> oh, how about you're so in love that you respect your partner so much and you see what an amazing life they're developing from not drinking. You think, oh, I want a piece of that. Yeah, I, I think that does happen, definitely. That. I think I think you lead by example. I mean, the thing is, I was going out and getting... When I did start to be sober curious in 2022, every time I then went out, I was getting, you know, horrifically drunk. You know, even a trip to the pub for three hours of be coming home being sick and banging my head on the side of the bath. 
you know, I was having these stints of sobriety of three or four weeks and then getting in a ride state. And it was just our relationship, you know, it was just getting like, why why would he want to be in a relationship with someone who's like, what kind of a role model was I being to the kids? But you see it now, don't you? Because you can see now how you wouldn't want to date anybody who was drinking. So why would we expect our long-term partners to date somebody or be with somebody who is drinking to the to excess as well? Mm. What would you do now, Alex, if Sam went out and got smashed? Well, this is a funny topic, actually, that I was going to talk about later. So we're going on holiday next April. And Sam said to me, because basically there's a a, a number of us going for his dad's birthday and we're all staying in a villa. So his younger brother's going to go. My son's going to go. My 19 year old son does have a drink. He's not silly with it, not excessive. And um, in the whole time that I've been sober, Sam's had one occasion where he had a drink and it was in the first year and it was his brother's 21st birthday. And he went out and had a drink with him and then he stopped and he's never drunk since. So five years. And he actually said to me, I might have a drink on that holiday in April. Honestly, I, I feel, I'm, I'm really having to work hard on myself to... Re- and I said to him, why have you told me that? I got really bad anxiety about it. And he said, because I know that you need to come to terms with it over the next eight months that I might want to have a drink. And I'm like, well, but why would you do that? You're five years sober. Why would you want to do it? Why would-? And he's look, I want the option, Alex. Stop trying to control it. He's, I'm finding it really tough. So I don't know. I was going to put it out there. I think if he did drink, he'd feel so horrendous the next day. Oh, yeah, he would. Under five years. And you actually- know what? He's not, he's not a good drinker anyway, my husband, does in. Um Sam's always been able to have a drink and then not have one for months. So he's never had an issue at all. Not even, not in any stretch of the imagination. He literally stopped drinking for a year to support me and has just never bothered. So he doesn't really say I'm sober. He doesn't feel the need to say I'm sober. It just, it's just a given that he doesn't drink. So if he does have a drink, he will probably have three or four pints and then that will be it. But still, it's giving me really bad anxiety. Rob's like that, you know. He he was never a big drinker anywhere. Um, he's never drank since I've met him. He's always said I'd never say never. Um, like if he went on a lad's holiday, he's never been on one in like the three years we've been together. Or, but he probably would. And I, I just find it like he always said he only had a couple anyway. So I think I probably wouldn't be that bothered. But if I saw him drunk... I I would just totally unfancy him right that minute. Like the, honestly, because I've never ever seen it. We've never been drunk together. With I've just never seen him drunk. I knew him at primary school. He was never drunk then. And we never. It was a gig before, at high before they were twelve. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it would kind of like absolutely freak me out. Drunk people, I I don't find attractive anyway. I've got to be honest now. I look, I can walk through, you know, if we walk through Manchester at night. Yeah. And you can see like it's that glazed look in people's eyes. It makes me feel uneasy. And and so I, I totally get why there is an absolute need for like sober dating apps. Mm. or a space for people to date safely because I just think it's I would I wouldn't like it I really wouldn't so so if, in my situation what would you be like do you think oh I wouldn't like it I'd I'd, I'd really I would struggle as well I, I get Sam's need for the choice because what he actually said was because I then brought it up a few days later and I was like oh I don't know how I feel about it and he was like look I'm not saying I'm going to do but I have to have the autonomy to decide. It, it can't be you trying to control this. Yeah, that's true. It's tr- it's, it is completely true. Yeah, it yeah. just messes with our heads a little bit, doesn't it? So I think I would be a bit like you. I think I'd have to have a little bit of time to get my head around it. Seven months. <laughs> yeah, so seven months would be fine, I think. But then I think I would make a plan for that occasion. So like if they were drinking, I think I'd have to say, look... I actually don't want to see you all pissed. Like, so I'm going to do something else on that on that day or that night. 
I, do, I, I think mm. I'd rather, but I'm like that anyway. If I don't like something, I close my eyes. And we, we discussed oh. that on the last podcast, yeah, actually. Yeah. I, just, yeah, I, I pretend it's not happening. So I would rather not be a part of it and not see it and then listen to how shit it feels the day after and sit there going, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure something. I want to be a part of it. But I'll, I don't think I'll get FOMO as in I want to do it. But this part of me wants to say, and I don't know if I have said it actually, I might have done. Um, well, how would you feel if it was me saying I'm just going to have a drink on one night out? But I know his answer would be, yeah, but you wouldn't leave it there. You would want to have a drink the next week and the next week. And he's probably right, to be fair. Even though I think I could control it completely. I've said it not very long ago. I feel like I could have a night out on the drink, then not touch it. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. I don't want to risk it because I don't know if I would. I don't think you would. What do you think? What do you mean? What are you going to say, Holly? I just okay. think, like, you know, when you open, when you, when you struggled with stopping something before, all it takes is one session and you've opened the door again wide open. Like, because the neural network to being pissed and to go into that mode is so strong when you've been like a regular drinker for decades and decades. You can be sober for two or three years, but one big night out, it just it's all your brain needs to be like, boom, you're back there now. I've I heard hear that. So it's really interesting. I've been listening to a few people on TikTok and there's a girl on there that I know. And she actually runs a sober community. And she drank the other week and she was like, I feel like I've got to this point where I'm more controlled. Like she's always said that she didn't want to binge drink anymore. And she started... So she had to drink. She didn't really enjoy it all that much. But a little bit like Sam, she didn't want to be controlled by her TikTok audience that genuinely do follow her because of the sobriety to begin with. Um, and she didn't, she wanted to have that choice. But I think it's just so hard when you talk about things like that. But I struggle in this because I never found it hard to give up. It you know, like these people that tried and tried and tried and you speak about struggling a little bit more At than I ever did with, like I made a decision to stop drinking for a hundred days and I've, and I'm six years on. Um, and I think a lot of things that stopped me starting again, are in the groups, I see people that have gone back to day one and yeah. highly regretted it. Um, the, the obstacle course by Claire Pooley is still is really, really in my mind about how you're in the field of bunnies now, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in the field of bunnies. Why do I want to go back? And like <laughs> honestly, and when I walk down the canal and on the lake, there's two separate fields with bunnies in them. And I never don't walk past and think, I've got you. I'm here. I'm here. And I'd I would feel like that. Want to go like back. That. My dad did it after nine and a half years of sobriety, had a drink and went back and it killed him. Yeah, and it did, you know, like it, it, six months on, it, it was what really brought the, I mean, potentially brought the end about. But And that was nine and a half years and he was living his best life in that nine and a half years. So I do feel like, does everybody think, get a little bit complacent and do you have to yeah. just stay on guard all the time because I never had the issues my dad had at all and I don't, I don't I wouldn't consider myself as having a problem with alcohol but I was definitely a problem drinker I would drink on a problem I would drink for stress I would drink emotionally I was an yeah, emotional drinker. I was like that yeah. but I think the one thing that people really underestimate is how powerful the drug is that is alcohol yeah. so if you met someone and they'd stayed off heroin for nine years and they were like, I just might have one more hit. Like, you know, just for our time's sake, what do you reckon? Because everyone else was doing it and because it's so normalised and glamorous. And if you do it, you'll be successful and sassy and hot and earn loads of money. It, you know, it's just we need to change the way that we look at it. You know, it's a drug. It's really powerful. And, yeah. it, and if we think we'll be all right if we have one drink, then that's just because we're watching other people around us who are all right or, Seemingly all yeah, right. and the reason we stopped is because we weren't like them other people. We couldn't just do that in the first place. I know I could. I've said it loads. Like, I think if I went and drank with Rob and said, right, come on, we'll have a night out. One, it, honestly, it, I don't like the idea of doing it. The only thing that I like the idea of sometimes is but letting my inhibitions go a little bit like going and uh, not caring and, having a dance yeah and not caring and going out and having a dance but actually truthfully when we did be wild last year 
not last year, the other month. This year, we, yeah. had, we had a silent disco, and that whole weekend, everybody let their inhibitions go. People were dancing, they were doing things that they'd never done before. So actually, if you are surrounded by the right people, then all them inhibitions go. So I'm thinking when I think, oh, I'd like to do that, it's that I'd like to do it with the old people, but I don't actually want to be with them all people. Do you know what I mean? Does that you mean can crave that? that old connection because you had it for so long and that's what it is for me. You know, I look back with, you know, the rose tinted glasses at that kind of group of girls at the pub and I think I just you know I'd love a little afternoon with them. But you know, unfortunately it's not that simple and it has consequences. So yeah, and that's the way in effect. Have they been anywhere since you've been sober? Do you know what I mean? That's what I think. Yeah, no, when no, I no, look no, at yeah. the old cravings that I get, I'm like, where the fuck have all them people been? They've not even... They've not even like, sort of phoned you up or texted you. No. They wanted to appear on your doorstep because you'd be freaking out. But, <laughs> you know, like, there's the effect, this fading effect bias as well. So the further away we move from the disaster the less we kind of see it as a disaster and the more glorified it becomes. It's like, you know, I've talked about this years back on the podcast. It's like childbirth, isn't it? The reason we have more children is because you forget how awful birth is. I never bloody forgot. Yeah, but you do. You forget, you like, you forget instantly how just dis- disgusting it is. <laughs> It's also it's like life disgusting. It's it's life disgusting. disgusting. You can die. We can die. The baby can yes. die. Everyone could die. Yeah. Oh God, it's awful. Life I don't mean like disgusting as in ooh disgusting. I mean the pain and the I know, but we've been awful. talking like ooh disgusting about your dog's willy. And now we can't use the same words associated with childbirth. Not, <laughs> yeah, but it's not a nice, pleasant experience. Like the getting the baby healthy and safe and everything. I feel like is. I look back on mine like glorious. <laughs> There you go. There's there's exhibit A, vegan effect bias. I bet you've forgotten all about the lump of placenta that was at the side here. Oh, no, that felt nice coming out afterward. Oh. That's the after bit, isn't it? That's beautiful compared to a baby. That's like a, oh, slop you it out. Paul, the afterbirth, <laughs> beautiful. That's as bad as me calling people Charles. People eat that. Disgusting. People eat that shit, Alex. Clearly, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I never ate mine just to put it out there maybe if I'd have had a baby in my older years I'd probably give it a go to be honest you know what my cousin had hers made into tablets I've heard that she did she had it made into tablets and took them just go to Holland and Barrett and buy some iron yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah like I don't know what I think. I've seen like a program ages ago where people cooked it up and that and offered it out to the family when they'd Oh, <laughs> cannibalism, isn't it? Instead of I'd, I'd have loved to have done that to you. You'd have come to see me after having the babies. I'd have loved to offer you some of my placenta. <laughs> oh, I'm not coming round again, ever. I don't know what I'm eating and drinking there. <laughs> no, I, you're, you can't talk. You carried your baby's disgusting thing around. For oh, the belly button. The key ring. Who yeah. does that? Well, my dad started it. Oh, it's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. <laughs> See? Childbirth, <laughs> disgusting. There's a good word for it. I'm I'll take it all back. It's forget. disgusting. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about how this app's going to work then, Holly, and when it's expected to come out. So what, you know, what, what how are you going to get people signing up, keeping them safe? Have you given it that much thought? Um, at the moment, we've got a landing page and... Um, we are putting a pitch together to go for investment, basically, because obviously it's going to need a lot of marketing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing some uh, I'm doing some digital CEO accelerator program with this um, awesome crazy Latino lady called Jamela Nafigas, who won The Apprentice. So I'm learning how to do digital. Wow, marketing. well done, um, you! But oh, I don't know if I'll have the you know the necessary skills up to speed in time to get this kind of launch. We thought it'd be nice be nice to have it ready for January because a lot of people obviously dry Jan. Yeah. It makes perfect sense for for it to happen then. So all being well, that's when the app will be launched. Um, but really, um, we just want to really make it crystal clear to people. It's not just for sober people. It's for people that want to go on a date that doesn't involve alcohol. Okay. So it's a little bit like what we say about our Be Wild trip. You can come along as long as you don't drink on that weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because the thing is, 
right? If you're a drinker um, and you're scared of the alcohol-free space, you're less likely to kind of dip your toe in it. Whereas if, if there's some, if there's a space that you can go to when you are still a drinker where you can get to know that actually people that don't drink aren't aliens with two heads or yeah. librarians, not there's anything wrong with librarians, but, you know, people that do drink, as I'm sure like you and you're probably the same as I was, we were quite judgmental about people that didn't drink, let's say. Yeah, Lisa wouldn't even speak to us. <laughs> Just a way to kind of like integrate the two the two worlds because hopefully you know fifty years time people will look back and view alcohol the way that you know we look at cigarettes. Um, I think they will. Just trying to facilitate some kind of way for like the movement to have a space for people to go and you know probably it will end up becoming the community platform where you can have you know go on a girls' night out with a load of girls. Oh, go- I'd love that. Yeah. And also, you know, more and more venues have got alcohol-free options now. So we want to collaborate and do recommendations of places for people to go. And hopefully they'd get a little bit of a discount on the mocktails or on the AF beers. Because obviously at the moment, AF beers are the same price as normal beers, which is crazy. So it would be nice. We found out why, you know. uh, Because they've got a short shelf life. Is that right? Short shelf life. Well, we, well, we think we found out why. Apparently, the woman who told me and Lisa when we were on a night out that they were just as expensive is because basically they are processed in exactly the same way. There's no difference in the way it's made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't actually cost any less to bottle it, to brew it. I don't mind as much now paying for a good alcohol-free drink as I did in the early days. I think when I was in like my first year or two, I'd be like, why should I be paying that much when I'm not even drinking? But that just shows but, you how much you valued the alcohol of it, didn't it? Yeah, ex- exactly. Whereas now, I'm like, actually, I- I'll go for a more expensive drink. Or, you know, I don't mind paying for it if the effort has been put into it. Like, that, yeah. yeah. And yeah. they have a lot of like wines and stuff now that are de-alcoholized rather yeah. than, do you know what I mean? And I, I kind of, that tells me that they've put a bit of effort into it, like kombucha and stuff like that. Oh, I love a kombucha. As, as long as people have worked for it, I don't mind paying for it. <laughs> Um, I don't drink them really anymore, you know. Hardly ever. I mean, I'm going to a party on Thursday for my auntie's 70th, which is fine for me to say because it's a surprise one, but this will have gone out after. (laughs) And she, um, they will all be pissed. They will because that's what my family do. And I will probably take some alcohol-free stuff there, but only because, not to fit in now anymore, which is weird, it would have been to fit in, but now it will because it feels like a special occasion and... I yeah, want to I make it special with my alcohol-free drink. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. just realised that right now. It's rare I have one. Do you drink them, Holly? Hardly, hardly. Yeah. Um, I think the alcohol-free red I had on Christmas Day at my mum's because every person in the room was drinking red wine and I thought, I need I need a glass of red wine in my hand that isn't red wine, just so I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Of course, I knew I wasn't, but just sipping it and I just felt so proud. I was like, my face isn't going pink. I'm not talking over everyone. I'm not swearing and the volume went up. Everyone was effing and jeffing, and you know, then the aggression comes out, and I was just like, just thank God I'm not part of it this year. <laughs> so, so I've, I, you know, I'm still really dubious of alcohol red wine, alcohol free red wine, because I've just never. I've, I had a sip of one that my mum got um, from Tesco. She said it was the best one ever, and I tried it like last year, and I actually thought, oh, that is quite good actually. But I, wine, I've like had alcohol free prosecco, mocktails, and lager. But actual wine, I've stayed away from. You know why I've stayed away from red wine? Because the first one I had, I literally went in Tesco's, Marks and Spencer's, Waitrose. I think I did about four big shops and tried every single bottle of red wine that I could find. And they were all shit. Yeah, they would be in the early days. I never found a red wine that tasted like red wine and red wine was my drink. So I've just never bothered and I've never gone back. I would love to find a good red wine, but I don't know whether that's because I still want the taste of the red wine that I used to have. So maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Thing is, I think like your taste buds change so much, don't they, when you stop drinking. 
you yeah. become you can taste so much more different things but when I even when I smell the worst is smelling white wine on uh, someone's breath when they're talking to me this close I'm just like oh my god and it's like you can you can almost see it evaporating off their lungs into your space and you're like oh god get it away from me yeah oh. and then the red wine in the corners of the mouth oh, oh, oh that's my, funny. my ex oh, she's I'm talking about that time and I'm like this is Please leave me Disgusting. Alone. He always had red wine there, and then he grew a pot belly, and you'd see dribbles of red wine. Oh. Where it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was disgusting. Um, I did have some amazing cocktails at this place I went to in Birmingham on Saturday. It's one of the, apparently, there's only five alcohol free bars in the UK, so this is one of them. And um, they it's have only five, aren't they? Uh, get out. Well, there's definitely none in Leeds. There's That's one in Manchester crazy, now. There is one in Manchester. I think Love From's closing. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, oh that's that's in Manchester. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, you went to Exhale in Birmingham, didn't you? Yeah. First, Sober Dave's sixtieth yeah. birthday. Yeah, um, I saw that actually, and I've been there, and yes. I agree. the The drinks are incredible. In fact, we yeah. spoke about them on a podcast, Alex, because we were staying away from um, Sentia drinks, were we? After we'd done that podcast oh, with Sentia stuff, yeah. What, what we called Professor Nut. Yeah, that one. Oh my God, what are you challenging to do your 30 day break? I was changing my son's bed listening to the podcast, and you were like, I can't believe you still drink the thing you need to try our challenge. And I was going, Oh my God, it's Professor. No, she was like, That well, Professor. Lisa was like, That well, Professor. You're not too old. You. <laughs> And I'm thinking, Lisa, shut up, shut up. It's true. Like, don't, yeah, come on. Love I'm you, that's the problem. He's sober, isn't it? Like, don't just use us as a marketing campaign. <laughs> don't you get pissed and then come on here thinking everyone will buy you drinks. It, 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 can I just put it out there that he actually wasn't pissed on the day? <laughs> no, he wasn't pissed. But listen, don't you think that's true? He likes his red wine the power of alcohol because yeah. he's there producing reports saying this is the most dangerous drug yeah. by far of anything yet I still drink yeah. why because I'm old nah you've bought into the rhetoric you, you're just a, you're one of the victims then if you're saying that. You, he I did say he loves red wine agree. he said he really enjoys red wine um I actually want to get him back on the podcast to talk about um magic mushrooms it? magic he wasn't just mag magic mushrooms but yeah all that psilocybin yeah. and all that yeah. Well, I don't think they're being allowed to use psilocybin for the research because of the laws that we've got. They're having to use ketamine instead um, for, you know, antidepressants and stuff like that. Um, what do they use ketamine for, antidepressants? Yeah, they're using ketamine to treat mental health conditions. It sedates people. I it, know. Because they, they won't, the UK won't license psilocybin, which is ridiculous. It's because ridiculous. Give them a hundred percent. They have in loads of European countries. Australia, they're um, licensing it, I think, this year in May. Um, Imagine not licensing psilocybin that grows wild in the. Field. Yeah, but you could say that with loads of stuff. If it's used badly, you've got to use these things properly. But, all right, yeah, but I, I get that. But imagine licensing horse tranquilizer for humans over mushrooms. It's to do with the pharmaceutical companies, isn't it? Money talks at the end of the day, which we all know. <laughs> it is. I do know yeah. what you mean, though. Yeah, you can obviously overdose on anything and you can use it stupidly. I know, it's it. like saying, isn't it, that like, where does heroin come from? Poppies. Yeah. 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 Do you know what I mean? So I don't think it's I don't think that's a valid thing to say. I think it's got to be used wisely. Yeah, but they won't even license it though for kind of medical grade use. But they'll license something they use in horse tranquilizer. It's crazy, and it's because, like you just said, Holly, it costs. It's, it makes a lot more money because anybody could just basically get hold of the mushrooms and do extract the psilocybin if they were clever enough. <laughs> Is that not what we do as kids? Probably. <laughs> one, I got trapped in a mirror. Never again. Did I've you? Never done I, I did it when I was about fourteen, and it was the crazy. Somebody jumped out of the telly at me. They popped they out. Say someone jumped out of the window. No, no, no. Two of my friends ended up in hospital um, <laughs> <laughs> the day after. Um, and yeah, somebody popped out at the time. Oh, it was a weird experience. Milk bottles dancing and and 
getting home and my mum had told me somebody had committed suicide and read me this poem that was a true bit but I was sat there tripping thinking what the hell (laughs) like all the walls were coming in it was awful experience I've never done it never ever no, no, don't bother. Don't bother. I can pass it all now. For and also, like we've got perimenopausal brains, we cannot take that shit. But on the other hand, apparently, if it's used in a microdosing way, it's really, really good for perimenopause and for other symptoms. Brain fog. I feel like Alex is being really pro drugs and alcohol today. Do you, oh, Holly? You are <laughs> pro alcohol. No, I'm not being pro alcohol. I am being pro drugs. Some drugs. I, I just think. <laughs> I just think if if drugs can have a therapeutic use and they're used properly and they're developed to be used properly, then it's not such a bad thing, especially when we're sat there with a class A drug that's legal and killing people and causes eight different types of cancer and going, yeah, it's all right, you can have that one, but you can't have that one. It's just yeah. hypocritical. It's, really, it's a minefield, I think. You know? I really struggle, especially like in the sober world. There's so many things and people do try all sorts of things and still claim that they're sober. And I, I'm not overly keen on all of it. Do you know what I mean? I, I really, really struggle with just stay away from drugs, kids. That's what Okay, I mean. let, let me ask you this. Right? I'm, I am being here again, again now. Last week's last episode will have been the cacao one yeah what's that's the what difference I was, between I, I don't, I don't, so cacao doesn't get you high does it but i don't know what we spoke about with liam from full power cacao last week we had um a few different conversations and i think he's quite pro like um ayahuasca and all stuff like yeah, that yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know where I stand on it. I, th- I feel like if things are done in a really safe environment, in a shamanic way or whatever, then fine. Um, but then I think, no, is it fine? Do you know what I mean? All these people going, go, yeah, cool, man, wearing T-shirts with mushrooms, saying, yeah, I'm sober, but I get smashed in forests all weekend. Like, I, d- I don't, I don't <laughs> It's I, don't know where st- I had a right, right good think about that podcast that we did with Liam, actually. And I, and I don't know where I stand on it. I don't, I'm not sure. Think. I'm not sure where I stand because I don't know where you draw your line. If we're saying, and we're giving the message out, that alcohol is glorified and glamorised and dangerous, how can we then say, but that one's all right? Oh, but that one's all right. I, but on the other hand... If you've got something that's natural and it's opening your mind and it's healing you and it's not causing eight types of cancer, is that different? And I just, yeah, I'm but like, you need Lee. to know what you're doing with this shit. Yeah. You yeah. can't just be going to forest with people having it and saying, mm. yeah, I've been to another planet and now I'm all right. And you come and, 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 and trying to get people in the forest with yeah. you to yeah. do it. Like, I don't, I just, don't think it's all right. Have you been invited on an ayahuasca retreat? <laughs> I, I have in the past, yeah. And I, you know what? Because of my magic mushroom experience, and I'm really grateful that I actually had quite a bad experience as a teenager because it stopped me from doing loads of other stuff. Yeah. Because I always yeah. had a fear about it. I think so you I stopped went, me because you were terrified of it. Yeah. When when I had friends that were like taking pills and doing stuff like that, like there was no way I would do any of that because I just, when I was younger, and I don't know if you remember this, you probably will, Alex, uh, the Leah Betts. So there was a big story about Leah Betts and she'd had an ecstasy and she died. Into, and I remember thinking that would be me. If I had that, that would. So I've always had that element of fear. Um, but then another part of me goes people people like to keep you fear don't they to stop you from finding the truth so who knows and 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 MDMA is also used medicinally yeah there's there's all these stories though aren't there where and we did briefly touch on this as well breath work um, hallucinogens you know like even magic mushrooms ayahuasca people report separately that on all of the, um, you know breathing deep like I've just said or even drowning during all those experiences <laughs> not that or I recommend drowning, drowning. <laughs> Not that I recommend drowning, but they say when you, when this, you know, people who've been brought back from a near death experience after drowning, they report the same as like deep breath work. And it's all this kind of 
other dimension to the world. So the the thing that makes me curious is how can these four or five different things that you do all show you this other dimension that potentially could be the truth? Da, da, da. I agree that we don't use our brains to the full capacity and there's probably things that we can use to like like magic mushrooms when I had them I was on the exact same trip as the the lad that I was with we were seeing the same thing it's like we were telepathic we were literally talking to it like how does that happen like we and then when we was normal <laughs> like days never after, been normal. we was like we were telepathic we knew we know. I still think I'm a bit telepathic anyway. Well, the I thing is, our, our energy doesn't just stop on the surface of our skin. No, our energy it goes out. You know, that's yeah. scientifically proven as well as obviously all of the ancient Eastern religions have believed it for thousands of years. Yeah. So if you think about it in that terms, you're mixing your energy with people that you're, you're surrounded by. And when you kind of take hallucinogens and you kind of open up that, that pathway, don't you? Yeah. But, you know, people who are really fantastic at meditation and get into the deepest, yeah, craziest exactly. tricks of meditation, they experience exactly the same pe- thing as the people attending yeah. troops. Their minds will do the same. So it's just different ways of reaching that kind of nirvana, I think they call it, don't they? Yeah. Uh, but I- you've got to train your brain, take your time, prepare, be in the right place and build up to it and learn how to get there safely. I don't think it's safe to just jump into like going to a field. And take I them. agree. Like, be patient. Do you know what I mean? Like, look, if you can do it, wait now, until meditation. you're dying from drowning, listeners, and then you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> I think with some breath work, I've definitely experienced the the difference between like when I've done breath work, I've realised that I am not my body. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like I've been, I've been in that zone where I realised, like, oh my god, I am literally not my body right which is basically ketamine yeah so you know what i mean like stop being impatient do a bit of breathing don't play the cat do some <laughs> work yeah it's definitely safer yeah a lot safer. Well, one thing i was going to say is that when you bring it back to alcohol so you had the mushrooms it was an awful experience for you and you won't do that again but you had the alcohol vomited everywhere it was an awful experience yeah, but they keep going again. back sure, and the it? thing is we don't seem to learn i know that if any of us took a drug and then we had a bad reaction to it none of us would do it again but we just seem to have this excuse for alcohol it must be something wrong with me i'm gonna do yeah, it yeah yeah it, it, it drives me it mad that actually, but yeah it's so and weird then- so weird. Then we do that whole thing, don't we? Of, well, I'm not addicted. I did it earlier on, or I, you know, my drinking was nowhere near like my dad's. Blah blah blah. But actually, yeah. perhaps you know, and I've gone back here before in the past. Perhaps I was addicted. Just because I wasn't physically dependent doesn't mean you're not addicted to a feeling or a buzz or an escape or you know a way of relaxing. You're you're addicted to what you believe it can give you, aren't you? Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point to take it on to like the next bit of sobriety. It's finding what it is that you would, why you were drinking. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who stop drinking and immediately replace it with something else equally as addictive, you know, like yeah, marathons. Or, and if you stop doing that and if you go and sit with yourself for two weeks on your own, I challenge you, then all the real stuff's going to come up and then you're really going to have to look at the triggers because they'll all come back as you're not running it off, you know, yeah. and sit with yourself and start to really address, right, what was going on there? Why did I pick up that drink? And it probably goes back to that 12-year-old self and you say, right, why did I need to feel like that all the time? It's and so then- true, that. That is so true what you're saying. But I can't even sit on my own on an evening, Holly. No. Still. I, I'm crap, you if know. I have to sit on an evening and my family are watching something on TV, I'll pick up my phone and start scrolling because I get bored. I want to move, and I don't. And I don't think it's because I find relaxation in movement. I genuinely think it's because I'm not comfortable just sat. Yeah, most people aren't. We're not really taught how to sit with ourselves. We're not taught how to be with ourselves. And there's so many distractions in the world at the moment. We've constantly got like a thousand sensory things happening at once. Um, But yeah, I think learning to sit by yourself is a skill. And for me, yoga has been like the gateway to me being able to be comfortable and sit with myself. And I mean, I can't believe it. I journal, I meditate. I don't know who I am. 
I've become this complete like, yeah, I just want to, you know, I'd love to just go and live in India and sit on a mountain. Oh, oh nice. You know, and just because, yeah, you kind of just get such a different perspective when you start kind of doing the deep work. Um, but it hasn't been easy at all for me. It's, you know, it's been really intensive. It's been really expensive. You know, I've paid a lot of money to train to become a coach. My dad, bless him, he's paid for this really, ex- I mean, I'm 45 and my dad paid for my therapy. Because <laughs> um, when I, I, I actually got drunk in December last year and I was so upset with myself and I just was like, I've got to get to the bottom of what this is about, just got to do it. Um, so I committed to EMDR therapy, which is a massive... Not before you got sober then, the December before you decided to get sober? No, I had no. I did all of last year. Oh wow! I think in December, and I I knew what my triggers had been, but I, I was like, I, I don't want that as an excuse because I've prepared for it, but it's still got me. What was that thing in me that wanted me to get wrecked? Why was it still there? Why was that self destruct button still there? And I just thought, well, it's obviously it's my childhood. I know it is. It's, I've had a lot of trauma and then layers of trauma throughout the decades. And um, I reached out to a few friends who I know had had really difficult situations they had to deal with. And they both said um, EMDR. And I got put in touch with a therapist. It's £120 a session. We- wow. And it's a massive commitment because you have to revisit the trauma, you have to absorb into it, you really go back there and then you have to have all these tools to cope with when you get home and the week after and then you start to kind of act out the age that you got taken back to in that session and it's been very... Oh, that sounds like a... Yeah, that's giving... I can feel my anxiety rising when you're doing that. I could. Yeah. I started wanting to say, oh, I want to try that and now you've started. I'm like, no. No, Lisa will not want to go back there, you see. You won't want to sit back with your 12 and 13 year old self. No, it's so hard. But what you do is you find the therapist you trust and you have to like trust the process a bit like with sobriety. Like I think because I've trusted the process, I did the same with this and I had the same attitude towards it. And there were weeks I'd go to her house and I'd say, I didn't want to be here today. My body is physically trying to stop me coming into this building. I don't want to be here. It's very resistant. And there'd be some weeks where we'd be doing the EMDR, I'd be looking left to right and I'd hit the painful bit, but then I'd bounce back to only good memories and she'd be like you've had enough you you, you can't go anymore because you're constantly bouncing back to positive things so we'd we'd end it and we'd do some grounding and breath work and then that week I'd have quite powerful dreams a lot of things would come back to me I'd process things in my dreams um, I would like to do MDA, EMDR because I, I genuinely look at your MDA. You nearly said MDA. It's on the brain. I genuinely do think EMDR would help me. I yeah, but I, I think it would me, you know. I got a lot from EFT, but I think I'd like to try that. What what worries me about it is, or oh, maybe not worries me, is because I've been I've had counselling a few times in my life overall now. Two, two or three, I can't remember. But always it's about the thing that's going on at the moment and always the thing is not the thing and it goes right back to my childhood, always. And I do feel that this time, but I did last time, like I've dealt with it and I've resolved it and I don't want to be forced into a position where I have to think back to it. So my question is, when you do EMDR, do you have to go back and consciously remember it or does the eye movement bring back what's there? It's almost like you have talking therapy and counselling and then the therapist will identify which part of that is emotional for you. And then all they'll do is say, you've you've mentioned that memory to me, sit there and think about that memory for me and watch this pencil go from left to right. And then you breathe. And then a few minutes later, she'll say, right, where's your mind at now? You know, so I could start off with like me crying in my bed and then the next memory could be me baking buns with my grandma when I'm 11. You know, and you don't know where it and what it is, is it's your it's your brain refiltering everything and putting it where it should be so that you stop bringing trauma that happened in your past into your present. What if you don't remember stuff? Can can you do it then? Do you think like because people block things out? So could you do like would it? bring things to the surface do you think that maybe a bit everything will come back everything is in there if your body and your mind are ready to deal with it it will show itself to you if it's not it won't 
Yeah, you, that's incredible. That. Your body is so good at protecting itself and your mind is really good at protecting yeah. it. it. won't let you take yourself, it won't allow you to get yourself into a really complicated, sticky place. Oh, you've done so much good work on yourself. Like really you really, have. you must be really, really proud of yourself. Do you get ever absolutely exhausted with working on yourself and think that right, I've had enough now? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. I've got ADHD though, so I'm never exhausted. I'm just yeah, like Well, we're gonna go into that actually. I wanted to talk about ADHD, Alex. With oh yeah, you. yeah. I've just I literally just opened up the chat and thought, I wonder if you could bring in your ADHD yeah. thing. Yeah, well, it, it would go well with drugs and ADHD because um so I tried one of my, my daughter's recently been diagnosed with ADHD and she really wanted to try the medication. Okay. It's something that we've kind of our family are very like, no, no, we can do it holistically or naturally or whatever. But she really, really what is been exhausted like with a brain. She has, bless her. And she really wanted to give it a go. So she's tried the medication. Anyway, she was a bit scared to try it. So I said, come on, I'll do it with you. So we both had um, an ADHD tablet when I was at work. Well, oh my God, I loved that day. Honestly, really? got, oh yeah, I loved it. Um, so much so, I've got an assessment on Monday for ADHD. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. I'm, go I'm going it. I'm, I've always like people meet me for not very long and like to tell me that I've got ADHD. Somebody phoned me once on Messenger just from my Facebook and said, I, and I answered because now I'm not as anxious as I used to be when now I've stopped drinking. Um, do you think you've got ADHD? And I was like, well, you have ringing me to tell, <laughs> tell me. And just through my Facebook, there was like, I think you've got ADHD. But um, so it's been a bit of a standard thing, hasn't it, Alex? And yeah. the more it's out there and the more things I see on social media, it's very relatable. I thought everybody was like this. It turns out not everybody. A lot of us are. Um but yeah, I tried the medication and I got a lot from it. Like I got shit done. Like I really, really did. You not think so, it could have been placebo? Like because you no, knew you'd had the tablet. No. Well, this is what I thought, but then I had another one, right? <laughs> <Yeah. day. laughs> Olivia rang me and she said, Will you come to the Trafford Centre with me? And I was like, Live. She went, I'll give you I'll give you one of my tablets. Overwhelmed <laughs> <laughs> in shopping centre. We've got a drug dealing theme going on, haven't we? Yeah, today? I know. Yeah, from my, from my daughter. Um, but yeah, so I went to the Trafford Centre with one and it gives me like, the only thing I can explain is my mind is constant, like constant. And I was, I've been becoming more aware of how constant it is. But when I had that tablet, it made me realise how constant it is because it kind of just gave me clarity. Like, for for example, walking through the Trafford Centre, I didn't feel like people were hurtling towards me. And you know what I said? It's like, it felt like ADHD is, is a superpower, right? And this is what it felt like. It felt like I just turned it off for a little bit just turned it off and give myself a break from so like it's like you can read everybody's minds and think everybody's thoughts and pick up on everybody's energies and it like it, it give me space from that where I could just go ah so as I was walking through me and Olivia was having a conversation with each other and we, and we were both like oh my god look at this we're just having a conversation with each other and not going oh look at that look at that look at this look at that and then when we went into the stores like we're normally going Zara together and we we literally picking up items right me and Liv together going what do you think of this what do you think of that do you think this looks all right and our reaction to the other one is uh yeah yeah what do you think of this what do you think there's no like communication a two-way thing it's really one way um so to actually be able to do that was really nice and at work and then this might be really bad I don't know if I should be saying this on the podcast so oh, the, she's gone the other day so we we reckon this all stems definitely from my mum right so she fully has ADHD so I'm telling her about it and she was like no no you're exaggerating so she said right I've got loads of work to do on Monday 
I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> so she tried one, right, on one day. And she, she literally <laughs> come to me out afterwards. She went, where can we get some of these? <laughs> really? She said, I've done six months of newsletters, Lisa. Six months of newsletters. She's said, normally I, I can't get past two without being distracted or doing something else. She got all the way. She got like a week's worth of work done in that like time. She said, and then she'd gone to town. And she needed to like change a phone contract. She said, and I was in this shop and I literally listened to the other person. She went, I listened to him. She said, in fact, I was that nice a person. He can't wait for me to go back. (laughs) (laughs) So we'd had like this, but I did, I did get a lot from it. A Mm. lot. So yeah, I'm going to have an assessment on Monday. I don't think I'd like to be a permanent, like on medication. I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think they might be nice to have now and again when I want a break from myself. Kind of like a glass of wine. (laughs) Maybe. No, it is exhausting being. Do you find that, Holly? If you've got ADHD, do you not get this? It makes total sense why you've done so much in this last like two years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It actually really does. Yeah. You've decided to stop drinking. You've gone full hog. You've done your coaching. You've enjoyed yoga. So fuck it. You're going to go and be a yoga teacher. You may, you've sat there talking to your mates. They've gone, you know what? I wish they were sober dating app. I, I know. I'll make one. Why did we not pick up on this ADHD nurse right at the beginning? It's so obvious. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's it's complicated when it comes to medication for ADHD. I've got a friend who is really similar to me, and your story you were just telling about being in Zara, me and her were in Liverpool in Primark, and we had that exact scenario. <laughs> <laughs> and then not really putting the clothes back where they're meant to be and then I'm like it's alright it's okay people get paid to put them in the right place it's alright let's carry on and I know like when I go shopping with my daughter she finds it really really hard to be with me full stop in that situation and my husband yeah. I, I don't even know how you survive in that brain of yours because it doesn't stop. Um, and the friend, the said friend um, that had been in Primark in Liverpool with, she went on the ADHD medication and I spend a lot of time with her and I do kind of think like, I kind of would like to be like that. And everyone's always like, I'm like her pre-medication. And then she's like, do what the afterwards is. Um, but um I don't know. I'm just a bit concerned about it. I've got thyroid problems. I've got hypothyroidism, which my thyroid health isn't sorted by any means at all. Um, That's my kind of priority in terms of my health. Um, Also, I'm trying to get off Citalopram, which was like my promise to myself when I gave up the alcohol. So I'm on half the dose I was on, you know, 18 months ago, and I'm hoping to half it again if I can, like maybe next year. But I'm really cautious about that because it's such an addictive antidepressant. And I yeah. hope since I had my boy and he's nine, uh, no one told me it was addictive. No one told me you're not going to be on a long term. This oh, is also yeah. getting sober. Um, but also my EMDR therapist really believes that there's such a strong link between complex PTSD and ADHD that if you can untangle the complex PTSD, that it will really reduce your symptoms of ADHD. Yeah. Um, and I do feel like I get a lot less overwhelmed for sure. And you know how your brain's constantly saying things over and over and over again. Yeah replaced that with affirmations yeah in the morning as soon as I open my eyes I say I am amazing I'm amazing I'm amazing I I put it on loop or if I go for a walk and I start getting distracted I'll just say like I'm grateful I'm grateful and I I, I constantly make sure that the loop is just positive statements Mm. and I think that's helping I'm not my brain saying, Holly, that I can't believe what a hypocrite, right, I am in this podcast. I'm going to say it now instead of afterwards, right, to Alex. But I've literally been talking about Alex being a pro drugs and alcohol. (laughs) Yeah, when you... (laughs) Telling people to be patient and do breath work and then just confess. (laughs) 
<laughs> Good point. You should have done breath work before you went to the Trafford Centre. Yeah, but to be yeah, fair, actually. Lisa, you have tried all those things. You have yeah. tried it. You, it's not like you're jumping straight in. You no. have done a lot of things to try and calm your mind. And you are a, the only thing you probably haven't done is EMDR. Which you might want to give that a go, but yeah, I think those I other things have worked. You've done your cold water dipping, you've done your yoga, you've yeah. done your breath work. They yeah. don't calm your mind, do they? They do for the time that I'm doing, but you can't walk the work around come com, like you do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> going through the traffic centre. Can you bear with me? <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm in it on your way round. Zara's oh. here, Zara's here, Zara's yeah. here, chanting. <laughs> 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 um, you know, one of the um, one of the reasons behind my thinking about the yoga teacher training is that when I often I get to the yoga class and my intention is always to quiet my mind. That's always my intention. And then obviously by the end of it, I'm like, oh, wow, what's that piece? Yes. But then obviously you get in the car and then, and then you're like, I could do that. I could do that. <laughs> and I was like, hang on a minute. What if I what if this was my income? And what if I did like taught five of these classes every day that's, and then you, that's then five the hours of peace every day so oh, so you've got to be careful me and Alex were talking about this the other day on yesterday the, on the phone. I was over yeah, literally, literally saying that everything that we enjoy was made into a job and you've got to be really careful you know like even with the set I promised myself that um I would go to sound baths and just enjoy them but every single one by the time I come out of it I was like I think I could do this. Full you set of same balls now. The only thing that puts me off is I probably smashed them. Because I thought one I did do get that. smashed. Oh, well, there you go. I yeah, by I my ADHD it. daughter, actually. Not oh. me. <laughs> She, she went past and tripped and just kind of knocked and it smashed, which cost me a fortune because I ended up buying two more. Yeah. Do, do you know um, what we're saying as well? So like similar sort of thing. It's like me with the organ play and this is how it came about because I fully don't like, don't think I've got ADHD, but everyone around me does. Everybody. I get the same as least people. So I think you have got ADHD and I go, no, 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 I haven't. I'm just a busy person, right? So this is how I've got around it. And I, I don't intend finding out if I have or not, if I'm honest. Um, but I've, I've start, I play the organ. That would have been... Buy one of my tablets next week. We'll find <laughs> I know. That will give me DM for detail. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. I'll do it. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. No, seriously. I was it would have been my escape at one point. And then I now do it as a job at the church. And then I had a funeral to play yesterday. So I was learning this piece, which isn't the type of piece that I would normally play. So I had to then learn a piece that I didn't particularly want to learn, which then makes the thing that I'm relaxed about a job, which then makes me not want to do the thing that I'm relaxed about to be relaxed yeah. about. It. And I got all, uh, uh, and then I come in from, how do I relax when everything that I've used to relax, like Lisa's just said, turned it into a job so yeah there's a bit of work needs doing i reckon that's the moral of that waffle <laughs> and i think like like you've got like we've got to think about this like we we started like our chaotic existence when we were teenagers and you oh, just mine started kind of, in the womb holly oh uh, <laughs> well yeah my side thinking i was one <laughs> but it's just you add and you add and it's like natural when you've had like a really difficult start to life it's quite natural to then fall into really difficult situations um so a lot of us have got an awful lot of stuff that we've got to deal with it's not just like the childhood shit it's that what, what happened the 10 years after the childhood shit it's probably more shit to be honest with you yeah and and you know in, when you do leave it later to deal with these things like like we've all done it's a whole lot of shit so but i, I just got loads of shit haven't we <laughs> but is that yeah. not just see this is where i just think he's being human sometimes i don't know a single human being who hasn't got a story yes Apart from me. all trauma's relative isn't it so yeah. everybody has trauma um it's just how you deal with it do you act it out and do you make the same mistakes as your parents or do you identify what went wrong work on yourself do the really hard work be really uncomfortable cry a lot scream a lot be a bit of a wanker but then come out at the end amazing and so we break. like hold a lot our parents accountable for a lot and like it's not really fair is it do you know what, what I mean I think you, what did I say to you the other week I'm sure I said it to you somebody said to me remember 
it's your parents' first time here too. Yeah. And that has really changed my view about my mum and dad and my upbringing. You've got they, to do. They were like me now, muddling the way through life with whatever they had. That's also, not confusing them. It's a fact. Yeah, and our parents were all brought up by a war generation. So yeah. Yeah. such a weird, such a different perspective on the world to what we've got. You know, they, they lived in fear of their lives and they had nothing. But it's a no. fact, isn't it, that everybody's only... All right, as we are right now, I'll change it for those people who might believe different. Maybe I believe different. Every, it's our first time on this planet as us. Like oh, this. yeah, I get where you're going with that. Yeah, because yeah. it might not be. Yeah. a bit careful, yeah. Yeah, that's all right. So it's our <laughs> first time here. So Go okay. sit in a forest and go back to the other life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, like, why would we think that our parents knew enough to bring us up any different? And then why would their parents and their parents... Everybody's muddling through for the first time. And and the only time yeah. in a body I mean, that's going to yeah. get damaged along the way. Yeah, you, you can't blame... I mean, you can't blame your parents for anything because they're products of their environment and stuff. Yeah. I certainly don't blame anyone for anything I've been through, but it's made me the person I am today, so I'm just kind of grateful that it happened. Yeah, um, yeah we've all got a BA somehow, haven't we? Like, uh, like, I like, <laughs> do you know once when I lived in Cyprus, right, there was a situation went on, which I'm not going to go into, but I'll never forget my cousin's wife at the time. There was this lad there and he was really getting upset and he was going... Oh, Oh, I've just come back out of the army and my mum and dad this time. And she went, shush you. Everybody has a story. We haven't got all night. And then... <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, dear. But she's right. She's right. You know, anyone can get the violins out if they want. It's just how you choose to look at the world. You've got a choice in how you think about things, haven't you? I fully, fully agree with that. I think that's a really nice end, actually, because yeah. you, you do have a choice. I, I say this to Rob when he comes back pissed off from work and like, mm, go, go work tomorrow. I'm like, well, you've got to go no matter what. So you either choose to go with a smile on your face or you can choose to be miserable. It's up to you. But whatever. Or you can happens, choose to leave if yeah. you can. Yeah, that's another thing, yeah. 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 Shopping Tesco's. <laughs> you know, sometimes what? it's easier. <laughs> I feel like we're going to talk fully about sober dating. I don't know where we went to today, but I absolutely... I enjoyed it. ...proper ADHD conversation by all three oh, of us. I bet us. we've exhausted our listeners. I They'll know, be like, what God, the hell's yeah. just happened? I <laughs> know, <laughs> like, listen to some nice, calming music after this. Honestly, I was really looking forward to speaking to you, and you've not disappointed, Holly. It's been really lovely. Before we do go, do you just want to... Um, reel off the list of where people can find you and um, how they can get to your landing page as well on the app. Oh, right. Yeah, great. So um, my coaching business is hellohollycoaching.com. Um, if you want to look at my retreats, it's just stick a forward slash retreats on there. You can also go to Hello You on Facebook, which is the retreats page. And then Soda Dates is on um, Instagram, but you can find it through the Hello Holly Coaching. Uh, brilliant please will you drop us an email with all your links um so we can pop them in the podcast notes and before oh, we do go is there anything that we don't mean later we mean now because we do the notes now yeah please we'll please would you do it now keep, keep yeah, that great. sign on your door and yeah. do it <laughs> and um, is there anything that you wanted to say before we go Oh, well, I know I love your motto and I just wanted to say that my favourite bit of it is to be kind. Should we ask That's you? Good. Should we do it proper? Yeah, let's yeah, do it. Because we haven't been um, using it this season, so yeah, we'll finish I'm on it. Really? Okay. Yeah. But our motto is be brave, be kind, be sober. Which one of these do you most relate to right now and why? Can't believe I remembered that. Oh, thank you. Um, definitely be kind because being kind to yourself is the most important thing that you'll ever do because if you're kind to yourself you'll be kind to everybody else and always speaking nicely to yourself doing affirmations and just using really kind words i think is really important especially for people who've got adhd yeah oh do you and know what you're not I'm a natural just... kind person practice it i'll just finish with saying one of my clients and if they if they listen and they might listen said something to me yesterday about not liking what they saw in the mirror and I said to my client, remember, there's lots and lots of people aspire to be just like you. And it's so true. Like you're always somebody's example, aren't you? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully she'll feel better soon and practice some affirmations. I hope so. Well, thank you so much for having me on, girls. It's been absolutely amazing fun. Thank you. Thank you, you been amazing. so much. See you later, Holly. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you for tuning into our podcast. We really do appreciate your support. So to stay updated with our latest episodes, be sure to follow or subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to share the Be Sober Love with your friends, helping us reach even more people. If you're interested in learning more about the impactful work we do, or you want to become part of our incredible Be Sober community, visit our website at besoberofficial.com. There you'll find all the information you need and discover how you can get involved. We look forward to welcoming you into our community of change makers. Until next time, be brave, be kind, and be sober!